So this is uh, lecture two on Iron Hans restoration of distorted masculine energy. So let's take a close in-depth look at the storyline that the key to release the wild man is under the mother's pillow. So I will draw heavily on this excellent book that is the first in a new series of republications of Jungian classics, Father, Daughter, Mother, Son, Freeing Ourselves from the Complexes that Bind Us by Zurich Jungian analyst Verena Kost. So the mother and father complexes are the most powerful because they are established in our earliest years in our experiences of mothering and fathering relationships. And there's Verena Kost. So this fairy tale steers us to focus on the positive and negative aspects of the mother complex in line with the trigram Tui, I don't know the Chinese pronunciation, where the top line, sort of the archetypal feminine, can be imagined as dominating and holding down the two yang archetypal masculine lines beneath it, causing a distortion of the masculine energy. Fast gives an excellent description of complexes from what I call the traditional Jungian perspective, that being the basic life experiences like the relationships with a personal mother and father constellate the archetypes of the mother and father stated as the archetypal core of the complex. We come into this world anticipating a mother and a father, and the archetype prompts projections of typical archetypal images onto real parents. As a scientist, I find it much simpler to consider the application of the mat mat mathematics of complexity theory to basic Jungian constructs like complexes, archetypes, and the self. So basic life processes and states are experienced in our own unique ways, depending on our genetic makeup, types of bodies we live in, interactions with the particular environments we are immersed in, et cetera. We naturally fantasize and project into the environment. So there is much more to an interaction between a mother and a child, for example, than can be described by objective observation. When the energy level in a system like the infant mother bond is increased due to excitement or stress, the complex, which is felt to be personal, morphs into another dimension, the archetypal numinous sacred dimension of human experience. Archetypes are thus described as emerging from the complex and not inherited like psychic organs as Jung described them, constellated from within. So I explored this in some depth in my book, Hermes, Eco-Psychology and Complexity Theory, positing Hermes as the god of complexity theory because Hermes' attributes metaphorically describe the characteristics of complexity theory. And Hermes is the god of the dream world, which operates on the principles of complexity theory. So let's look at how the key under mother's pillow is it related to people with an originally positive mother complex for whom Koss says, quote, life is good and right as are they themselves. They open themselves up to a world which they trust they expect things to go well, and their expectations are often fulfilled. They show a fundamental faith in the world, often too much so. Quote, um, it will all sort itself out somehow, end of quote, is a typical feeling. Their confidence in life can also be a form of laziness, an assumption that other people will look after their needs. They tend to want to enjoy everything, to have their cake and eat it too, with a focus on wholeness to have all their desires fulfilled. They therefore gravitate toward theories which focus on wholeness. The mother realm, and with it the mother complex too, is formed from early infancy on and is therefore active at the preverbal stage. Although it may remain a formative influence throughout all stages of our life, its atmosphere is essentially connected with earliest childhood. As such, it relates particularly to our bodily well-being and to our ability to feel secure in our physical contact with others and consequently be open to intimacy 
of all kinds. So it is characteristic of the originally positive mother complex that all the physical expressions of the child are accepted and affirmed, not only the clean and pleasant smelling ones. People who have therefore experienced life as a great mother who cares for them usually have a relaxed and positive relationship to their physical existence. They tend to be close to their own senses, to sensual experience in its broadest form. Then the original positive mother complex is more than enjoying the oral experience, but things can be enjoyed at many different levels. They tend to have a close and intuitive relationship with the unconscious, and they are often imaginative and creative people. So their negative aspects are that their, quote, potential is not always fully realized. They can also be unrealistic and impractical, in which case their potential is merely an unfulfilled promise. To ground ideas in reality takes persistence, which is a form of aggression. It also uh, requires a capacity for self-denial and for tolerating setbacks. If the ego complex is unable to uh, emancipate itself from the originally positive mother complex, the boundaries of the ego fail to become clearly defined. When this is the case, there is also the danger of impulsive and uncontrolled outbreaks of all kinds of emotions. Quoting cost, when conditions are right though, the people formed by this kind of complex are friendly, accommodating, and also sympathetic. They love everything to be harmonious. They thrive on an oceanic feeling in which the interconnectedness of all things can be experienced and in which the differences between people are resolved or overlooked. A shared experience of life's abundance is important to them, which creates a feeling of unity and love. This feeling arises in them when they attain what they consider to be everything. So the atmosphere of the original positive mother complex is similar to Jung's description of the anima and the animus as, quote, images of the mysterious and attractive stranger, unquote. In dreams and projections, the ex experience is of a deep oceanic feeling and for a boundaryless, absolute feeling of unity that can never be achieved, but expressed in a desire for an unbounded physical connection, sexuality, for example, but experienced as wholeness. The mother and father complexes are the formative elements of the anima and the animus that at the archetypal level have aspects lacking in the original complex, quote, providing stimulus for development away from them, end of quote. So there are two main difficulties with this complex. First, separation as accepting the existence of death in association with possible new beginnings. Second, difficulty making decisions, meaning one favors one thing against another, and that requires aggression. They can be aggressive in taking what they want because, quote, as theirs by right. They see the abundance of right as theirs by right. If they see themselves as a special gift to the world and are not treated accordingly, they can easily be offended and hurt, becoming difficult to be with, abusing substances to get that oceanic feeling and deliver them from the evils of the world and or become passive aggressive. The problems become more pronounced when their ego identity is not appropriate for their age, and they identify with the mother as the great goddess in her various aspects, usually with illusions of grandeur or anything identifying with the eternal child or alternately with both. Men may seem both boyish for their age and appear to be too soft, while women who identify with the motherly role may come across as girlish and more like daughters than adult women. So this complex retards personal development and age-appropriate reliving. The mother figures often discourage emancipation and brand it as bad or wrong, 
because as dependent persons themselves, they find it hard to encourage their children's autonomy. The children serve to maintain a parent's idealized self-image, to enable their parents to recreate the longed-for feeling and atmosphere of the originally positive mother complex. Such people may fail to accept and integrate their aggression and use it to shut themselves off from the world instead of engaging it. The complex can lead to depressive tendencies because the ego remains too inactive and with poor boundaries with other people. There is often a great need for acceptance and love that when not satisfied, often leads to attempts to gain it through achievements while being furious for the world, not being more accommodating to them. Showing anger at this would separate them from the world so they turn the anger against themselves, which leads to depression. They are plagued with guilt because they feel the problem is their fault that they haven't met the high expectations of themselves and others. Fear and anxiety arise is the psychological development in the transition from symbiosis to individuation, from dependency to independence, from obedience to responsibility, and from union with others to a greater degree of self-definition. Included in the formation of a coherent, well-defined ego complex are parents permitting and encouraging, or at least not hindering, ego activity in the sense of separation and self-discovery. The process of individuation necessitates the loss of a wonderful state of unseparated wholeness. So Jung suggests that archetypes are always activated, which are most lacking in common consciousness, a creative potential for the psyche to be self-regulating for the individual and for a culture. Mother goddesses are primarily characterized by the attributes of giving birth and uh, nourishment with three distinct aspects to the process of bearing a child. Fertile receptivity, carrying to the full term, and pushing out when the time is right. The goddess characteristics are transposed onto nature where the earth is seen as a mother who creates and sustains life and the mystery of female fertility, but also death and regeneration as seasonal rhythms. Goddesses are associated with the transformation of grief into joy in conjunction with the experiences of separation and wholeness. The unity experience in the mother realm must undergo the fragmentation and suffering of a separation for a unique individual to emerge and experience wholeness. It is possible to develop beyond the originally positive mother complex in ways which retain its rich abundance, yet also integrate it into adult life. And fairy tales provide us with symbolic examples of such development in a concise archetypal narrative. This process can be described in psychoanalytic case studies but they don't grip the psyche like a fairy tale can. Iron Hans is one version of this process. Uh, to continue, it is common for a parent's loneliness to hinder a child from developing independence and sympathy and readiness to help are symptomatic of an originally positive mother complex. So the man with an originally positive mother complex will be confronted by doubt as to whether he is a real man. If his mother assures him that he is, this is no value. If somebody else assures him of it, it is equally of no value since it does not come from his mother. A man with this form of complex needs to experience, usually in friendship with another man in which rivalry has been set aside and in which both pursue a common aim that he can assert himself against men who try to demonize him, is equal to them, and is able to stand up for himself. So the originally positive mother complex encroaches less on a woman's search for identity than it does for a man. So the originally positive mother complex does not, by its very nature, accept aggression and separation. 
but splits them off from its ideal and banishes them. These banished aspects are contained as potential in the rejected shadow. The process of separation and emancipation causes them to rear their heads and overwhelm us. This is one perspective on the Iron Hans fairy tale, the banished shadow has become deadly. People with this complex must experience ordinary life and be subservient at times because no one can be special and out of the ordinary all the time and in all situations. Sexuality poses a special problem because the Oedipal complex for a man and erotic desires lead to connection with a person outside the orbit of the good mother. For a woman, it's the animus closer related to the father complex that ruptures the unity feeling in the mother realm. So the second perspective on the riddle of the key being under the mother's pillow comes from having an originally negative mother complex. One cause is a mother who is an unself-confident and depressive woman who lives for her children. People with an originally negative mother complex have in common the feeling that both they and the world are bad. They have no sense of an unquestioned right to existence, and they believe they themselves are ultimately to blame for everything. It is also uncommon for them to remain very attached, almost glued to their mother or to the people to whom they project the mother complex, even when their desires continue to be thwarted. They keep hoping unconsciously that the mother will at last give them her blessing and realize she was wrong to undervalue them. Such people never really feel a sense of belonging to others, even though they strive for it with all their might, and inherent in their complex is the belief and expectation that they will always be rejected and treated badly. Their isolated ego has great difficulty in forming satisfactory relationships with other people. They are ruled by primal fear and distrust, which leads them to try to control everything as much as possible. This compensatory real behavior is often seen from the outside as a power complex, but it's in fact a desperate attempt to survive by someone who feels quite powerless. Their primal distrust, as well as the capacity they developed in childhood for being over aware of every situation so as to avoid dangerous situations or take advantage of more favorable ones, means they perceive the slightest emotional nuances in people around them. Also, they often interpret or misinterpret such nuances as rejection. They will then frequently react with great rage, which at least opens them up emotionally and releases the life energy within them, or with repressed rage, which is passive aggressive. People suffer from this complex have often not learned to deal properly with anger and aggression, which is what Iron Hans is all about. A feeling of hopelessness is inherent in their primal distrust. Instead of a natural, unassailable unity with the world and other people, the predominating sense of isolation and rejection, like anything to belong. Their capacity for rivalry and jealousy is usually far stronger than their capacity for active love, even though they will often make great demands upon themselves in a relationship situation. Their enormous longing to trust life and to be part of it cannot be realized. Those who have more vitality and greater access to helpful oases within the complex may have the conviction that they must struggle to make up for what they're missing in their lives, whereas those with less energy and fewer oases within the complex will continually accuse the world of not providing what they need. But neither of the approaches will replace the feelings of love acceptance, and self-esteem that they long for. Such people often seek compensation through the father complex. They try to attain self-esteem and social acceptance by means of their outer achievements. 
So an originally negative mother complex combined with a weak father complex underlies narcissistic disorders frequently accompanied by psychosomatic problems. So considerable relief can come if they can gain therapeutic insight into their problem and its dynamics, but it's a long, hard road to develop the capacity to show gratitude towards those who show them affection and to sense the rich abundance in the world. The therapist must express genuine interest toward them and be able to communicate empathy for their difficulties in childhood and have them realize that they are not to blame for the situation. They must be encouraged to express all their feelings and so that discover their gifts and who they are. Their survival strategies must be honored, what I like to call, how did you survive your childhood? and have them draw upon oases and other complexes outside the negative mother complex because they have a tendency to see everything in very bleak terms. So men will benefit from, quote, developing positive relationships with women and allowing different images of women to arise in their psyche, end of quote. But this path is initially closed to them. Other modes, models for themselves and the world may arise from fantasy or literature. Having archetypal images of a nurturing mother may emerge from the psyche in a self-regulating manner. They must not try to find justification for their existence from others and realize it ultimately must come from themselves. There are endless variations and combinations of father and mother complexes. We all have them to a certain degree, so it is best to ask when you experience them. When do they surface, and how does it affect your self-image and your relationships? It is much more difficult to free ourselves from fantasies we are hardly aware of than from actual parent figures. We must realize that our personal complex structure is embedded in the collective complexes of our culture in its attitude towards men and women's natures and their roles. Psychologist Eric Fromm's concept is that, quote, human life is a continual process of birth in which every stage is only transitory and the whole aim ultimately is to be born before we die. Freeing ourselves from the influence of the father and mother is to leave a whole landscape behind or at least transmute it into other forms. We have to stake our territory in the unknown. And for this, we can rely only on our feelings, thinking, dreaming, and the capacity for going out towards others. We don't eradicate all the complex patterns which have formed us, but develop a sense of our, our own feeling in any situation as opposed to those which arise out of the complex. We can recognize the latter by their habitual, repetitive nature. We will be able to recognize and relate to a you in another person and not simply project aspects of our complexes onto them and seek either a preordained fulfillment or confirmation of our poor expectations. Cost gives excellent case examples and good analyses of fairy tales to illustrate her points that I have only been able to highlight. I'm recommending this book to my analysands who are therapists, and I have been doing the same with Ulanov's Cinderella and her sisters. Hexagram 18 seems the most related to therapy work associated with the issues in our fairy tale, and you can see the relationships to cost psychological description of the complex. So the image for goo, I don't know the pronunciation, Work on what has been spoiled, decay, is a bowl with worms breeding in the contents of the bowl that indicates decay. The Wilhelm Baines translation says decay has come about, quote, because the gentle indifference of the lower trigram has come together with the rigid uh, inertia of the upper, and the result is stagnation, end of quote. The rigid inertia would be the deep constrictive power of the foundational mother and father complexes as Koss described. 
quote, since the, this implies guilt, unquote, the Yijing says, the conditions embody a demand for a removal of the cause to work on what has been spoiled. What has been spoiled through man's fault can be made good through man's work. The corruption has resulted from the abuse of human freedom. Work towards improving conditions promises well because it accords with the possibilities of the time. We must not recoil from the work in danger, but must take hold energetically. Wilhelm continues, success depends, however, on proper deliberation. We must first know the causes of corruption before we can do away with them. Then we must see to it that the new way is safely entered upon so that a relapse may be avoided. Decisiveness and energy must take the place of the inertia and indifference that has led to decay in order that the ending may be followed by a new beginning. End of quote. So four of the six lines involve what has been spoiled by the father, but line two is about, quote, setting right what has been spoiled by the mother. One must not be too persevering, end of quote. This refers to mistakes that as a result of weakness have brought about decay, hence the symbol work has been spoiled by the mother. In setting things right in such a case, a certain gentle consideration is called for. In order not to wound, one should not attempt to proceed too drastically. This makes sense therapeutically because we are dealing with foundational mother complex issues of love and unity at the core of self-esteem and stability. Yes, I apologize for all the reading here, but I wanted to be sure that I got through this kind of condensation of this very important book to have it translated into Chinese. So uh, this was the most efficient way I could think of doing it. Let's see how these points that Koss made and the guidance from the I Ching apply to a particular case I worked with years ago, a very intense situation as we will soon see. So remember, we are considering all this within the context of our fairy tale, Iron Hunts. A 40-year-old man I will call Charles did intensive work on weekends for just over two years and 242 hours of analysis. He was suffering from strong mood swings that included very black moods. He was bored with his university professor position and the chairman of his department was undermining him. He was married with two children and having a difficult and frustrating sexual relationship with his wife, who was from a very psychologically disturbed family with a schizophrenic son. He was an only child of a very controlling mother who would not express her anger. An experience at age seven encapsulated his life's relationship with her. They were shopping for pants for him, and he tried on many, many pairs. He finally blurted out, don't you think you're being too fussy? At which point, mother burst into tears and went behind a screen to cry. This shocked him as he had never seen his mother express emotions. He begged his mother to forgive him as she continued to weep. For every assertion of, I'm sorry, she would only choke out, you ought to be. Everything was smooth on the surface after a few minutes, but underneath, Charles felt guilty, furious, and strangled. But under the rules of their relationship, there was nothing he could do about it. Charles felt he said goodbye to part of his life he would have to seal off. And this is a great example of the key being on their mother's pillow. So he had uh, had an incestuously close bond to her as her crown prince. His meek father was a sideshow by the time he returned from World War II. Charles would eventually come to resent father for not defending him against his devouring mother. He had been engaged in college, but his father confronted him because mother did not approve of the young woman. Charles got depressed and his father reprimanded him for that, to which Charles replied, you got what you wanted, now let me be depressed. 
Mother went upstairs and cried, and Charles apologized, but felt a bit like he did with the pants incident at age seven. Years later, during our work together, Charles was appalled by how cruel his mother's comments were about his wife and their marriage, feeling that they were almost evil comments. There was some truth in all uh, what she said about his wife, but he felt terrible, quote, murderous and angry, end of quote, for not defending himself and his wife better. Think of the situation at the beginning of our fairy tale where there was some murderous force that we eventually found out was masculine in that forest. Let's look at some dreams. He was 22 years old in college when he lost his academic focus, was sleeping most of the time, and was working in a menial job. He felt a painful fall from grace as the crown prince to his mother to a place of utter insignificance and failure. Then he had this dream. I'm at the top of a winding staircase 10 or 12 stories high with no floor connecting it to the walls. I know I must get down and I'm fearful. As I run down, I meet a witch on the third or fourth landing wearing a black hat pulled over her face in the shadows. I bowl her over and run down the stairs, laughing hysterically and peeing in my pants. Did I kill her? Now I'm at a urinal and the police come to take me away. I end up as a slave in a boudoir in a palace, standing and waiting as an older woman at a mirror is putting on makeup and talking without really saying anything. 接下来他做了如下的梦。首先他说我站在一座高达十到十二层的蜿蜒的楼梯的顶端。楼梯没有与地板或者是墙壁相连。我知道我必须得下去。我感到非常害怕。当我跑下来的时候,我在第三或第四
insufficient masculinity, underdeveloped masculinity, end of quote. And that, quote, the masculine model has been absent in your life. And he suggested that Charles go into the army. One thing that tells us a great deal about our analysands is what movies or plays or even operas they strongly identify with. And this TV series tells us so much about Charles. Charles strongly identified with Kimball in the TV show, The Fugitive. Kimball was the neurotic hero who always had a secret script that no one else was aware of, always needing to defend and protect himself, always having to think twice before he spoke so his identity would not be revealed. Charles was also drawn and repelled by the one-armed man who had killed Kimball's wife, whose death Dr. Kimball had been wrongly accused of. Charles described the one-eyed man as, quote, that degenerative, motiveless criminal, perhaps the personification of my long repressed rage. Kimball and I are on the run from impossible old roles and from sinister parts of ourselves. Twenty years later, a Jungian analyst referred Charles to me, saying he should work with a man and with some focus on masculine energy. So here are two dreams he had in the interval between seeing that analyst and starting analysis with me. He had the first dream after taking his children to see his mother. And here's the dream. I'm living at home with mother. I'm going psychotic. The psychologist I worked with for eight months can barely contain me and get me back. The second dream, somebody is letting the lions out of their cages at the zoo. It feels like a conspiracy. With one of my daughters, I go into the huge lion environment with caves and rocky hills. The big cats come around and rub against me. We sort of take them with us, or is it us with them. They are huge and very frightening, not friendly, totally different and awesome, powerful. I get out of the environment and my daughter comes after. My wife is there and we are talking about what we should do about this. Go to the police or do something else. There we go. So imagine uh, uh, your kids being around an unfriendly lion being in the same environment with it. So the first of these presenting dreams shows a desperate type of psychic energy that was in the background of our work together and suggests that therapy could help him from getting lost in a psychosis. The second dream displays powerful and frightening primal forces being released that had been caged up and a child left on our own to escape from them. We don't have a strong ego to work with here. Two other dreams around this time also had his children being exposed to deep unconscious stirrings in the psyche. And think of our eight-year-old boy being exposed to the deadly iron haunts. Between our first and second intensive weekends of dream work and analysis, he dreamt of seeing the devil appearing like a vampire, and he had to swallow Jesus to save himself. So can you imagine what it's like to live in that psyche where you have a devil image? This is Dracula sucks life from the living. He is seen as a devouring aspect of the Great Mother. Jungian analyst Eric Neumann in The Origins and History of Consciousness, a book that Jung greatly admired, described it as the struggle stage in the Seth Bohr archetype of male development where masculine energy has not established itself independent of the great mother as the unconscious who will sacrifice and resorb the male. The Bohr Seth is the destructive side of the great mother. The night after the Dracula Jesus dream, Charles dreamt the solution to my painful state of mind requires balancing two opposing forces. I can find the solution in my black notebook if I read it carefully. This suggests the importance of careful reflection 
analysis and understanding his dreams, active imagination, and journaling contained in his notebook. The mother factor in Charles' inner family was depicted in a dream two weeks later where she is driving and Charles and his wife and father are passengers. She seems to be unconscious of the fact that she nearly got them killed by a train and are scraping another car and then scraping a building. One of the reasons I wanted to present this particular case is I know a lot of you in China work with uh, sand trays and this sand tray very well illustrates what we are dealing with. Let's look at a sand tray, but first a dream he had two nights before our sand tray sessions, about two months after he started analysis, the dream. There is a man who has been wounded in war, a great wound in his stomach. He is in bed dying and I have been nursing him. He has been giving me some advice and I have been failing to carry it out, though it gives me pain and remorse that I haven't done so. So here is the sand tray, and within the square space delineated by the seashells, I hope you can see them, they're, they're white, but there are four of them, and they would delineate a square. Uh, there is a snail behind a totem pole. In front of the totem pole lies a wounded man behind a soldier in medieval armor about to throw a short lance at the giant black toad. On either side of the soldier are two lions. Charles is astrologically a Leo and likes lions, but remember the fearful dream where the lions are let out of the cages. The lions as appearing in the sand tray may be thought of as helpful animals, what indigenous people call spirit animals or medicine animals. There's another look at it. And Charles said of the snail that it is smooth and can retreat into its shell. It could also be thought of as keeping things tightly within and living a life with very low energy. We can think of the big black toad as the negative mother. What is ominous is his association of the horseshoes as magnets that are drawing towards each other. Is this the devouring aspect of the great mother that he is trying to separate from? Charles described the sand tray scene as guerrilla warfare and said, you can't win an out and out pitched battle against the mother. He felt this would suck him in. Don't give her anything to grab on so she can do that. Given how close the lance thrower is to this huge toad, Need we doubt how this engagement will turn out? The sand tray echoes the witch in the stairwell dream he had almost 20 years earlier when he entered his first therapy. A dream he had months later reflected an impetuous recklessness that was seen in other dreams. He dreamt he was golfing in the middle of the city and hit a drive that broke a big window in a house, incurring the wrath of the male householder. Another dream he had almost a year later in analysis portrayed a fragile ego under great pressure. He dreamt that men and boys were playing an intense baseball game, but they were made from milk contained in those big plastic bags of milk that they put in milk dispensers. A good hitter and a catcher, both of whom had played the games for 20 years, it was 20 years after he told that first dream to analysts, were killed when their membranes were punctured in the game. The catcher's membrane from a collision at home plate and the milk spilled out and they were dead. Mm -hmm. Notice the spikes on the shoes as well. And if you're in a plastic uh, bag, you're in a, incredibly vulnerable. Mm -hmm. When baseball, you score a run when you go around the bases and touch home plate. And one of the most dramatic things that happens in baseball is when the catcher has the ball and the runner is coming in and has to wants to hit the catcher so hard that he knocks the ball loose. It's a very intense collision. So the what it feels like to be in Charles' psyche is that with such an intense collision, 
if your body is just a plastic bag full of liquid, it's a very dangerous situation. There are many symbolic dimensions of baseball that I will not go into, but in many ways, it is a game of life. Charles had used the I Ching on several occasions for guidance in relating to his mother, his wife, and his job situation. Then he asked a question I do not recommend unless you are ready to live with the answer for the rest of your life. He asked, what is the hexagram for my life? And he got hexagram 62, preponderance of the small with two strong lines within and two weak lines on the top and the bottom. Wilhelm says, under the judgment, we must understand the demands of the time in order to find the necessary offset for the deficiencies and damages. In any event, we must not count on great success, since the necessary strength is lacking. In this lies the importance of the message that one should not strive after lofty things, but hold to lowly things. Under the image, we read that the person is to, quote, always have his eyes more closely and directed on duty than the ordinary man, end of quote. Be extremely simple and unpretentious, end of quote. In personal expenditures and in all external matters, be on the side of the lowly. Charles terminated the analysis after two years and two months because of the expense, the tiring eight-hour round-trip commute, and a desire to invest in a second wilderness experience he said had given him a better sense of self and what his likable traits were. In my closing case summary, I mentioned that our work had made it clear how extensive his mother complex was and how essential it was to integrate the shadow and develop his masculine energies. He said he wasn't as complexed out, as he put it, relating to his mother, and was better able to stand up to his wife and assert himself more. I hoped he would do more therapy and not attempt too much at any one time as his dreams had warned. Here's what happened. So shortly before the therapy ended, he had a dream that he was with a group of archaeologists that had just excavated a man who had died ages ago and whose body was covered with long, wavy hair. As they looked at him, he began to come to life. So we recognized this as an archetypal masculine energies that were starting to stir in him. He later joined a group where he was encouraged to just do it, to live life to the fullest. He brought a motorcycle, and within a short period of time, he was hospitalized with a psychosis. He was in and out of hospitals. His wife eventually divorced him, but he barely managed to hang on to his tenured university position. He contacted me six years later and was still on antipsychotic medication. Kind of apologies for squeezing so much material into the lecture, but when I proposed the course, I had not read Verena Koss' book. I just thought it was so important that I had to squeeze it into the lecture series. So, and uh, the question is um, from Rosie, and um, it's um, about the, your clinic case, the case. And uh, she's wondering, she noticed that, that some part of uh, the client's unconscious has been transformed in some way. But still, he got the psychotic episode. So and, um, now the question is, uh, could you please say more about it? Yeah, this was a, a case that I had very early in my career. And I knew from the beginning, from the dreams, just of what the dangers were, how close he was to a psychosis. He worked very intensely at it. But I was also familiar with his uh, family, and uh, I could see how much his wife and their relationship was similar to his relationship with his mother. So to have been a successful case, I think it would have had to have employed some deep family therapy and for his wife to have been in analysis as well. 
because it was too much for him to try to contend with all of that negative mother energy and some of it had been transferred to his wife and we could see from the sand tray just how difficult it was but we could also feel how much energy he had bottled up and how desperate he was to to live part of the problem too was that he lived four hours out of town but i would like to think that with the proper containers and approach that this energy could have been transformed but you could see and especially with that image of the wild man at the end how relevant it is to our fairy tale this is such a significant issue about working with people with a potential psychosis and i must mention a client i had in my field placement before i went to zurich it was a man who had been in the in one of the big state mental hospitals in California, a schizophrenic. And he was pushing a broom around in the hospital one day, and he realized that that was going to be the rest of his life on these he heavy antipsychotics. He was determined to get out of there, which he did. And when he came to see me, he had met, married another schizophrenic who had been in the hospital as well. We worked with some of his dreams and he would sit there and he would just be almost like squeezing the life out of his knees, just hanging on. But he knew that it was either that he struggled mightily to contain himself, otherwise it was back to the hospital. He had a dream, one of the dreams I'll never forget, he dreamt that his ex-wife was walking over his body and she had knives uh, for spikes on the bottom of our shoes. And I said, boy, you really have a, a very deadly negative anima in your psyche. And there was something about those Jungian archetypal constructs that really helped him. <laughs> and here later on, I was doing couples therapy with his wife and him. One of the courses I had in Zurich was taught by a psychiatrist. And she said, Jungians are very good for working with schizophrenics because schizophrenics really live in an archetypal realm. So you have to have an archetypal framework for able to be able to understand them and relate to them. And remember, Jung worked with uh, several schizophrenics at Berkholsley Ber uh, in that incredible state hospital that he started out with. That is not to say that that my client was a schizophrenic, but he had a psychotic episode. It could have been a consequence of a manic episode, probably from bipolar disorder, which reminds me, uh, I have been working with a fellow that's uh, been bipolar for years, and you can see those incredibly powerful energies in his psyche, rather similar to the lions in Charles' dreams. So I think this question is related to the aggression and the excitement. And you talk about before in your presentation that we are entitled to enjoy the rich life and also uh, to we can have some aggressive and uh, uh, some aggressive behaviors, right? And uh, with some excitement involved in. So, and as a counselor, and um, um, we can observe that the people suffer from, the children suffer from the, maybe the ADHD, they have the problem of uh, aggression and excite, over stimuli or over excitement, uh, excit excited. So we uh, get to know that it has to do with the early, uh, uh, maybe the early infantile rearing environment is not perfect or it's not good enough, and it may impact their neural development. So what's your perspective? How you see this connection? Their neural development, uh, maybe, sorry, the question, the exact question is, and maybe the aggression and, uh, and excitement um, was brought by the neural 
some problem in their neural development. I haven't worked enough with ADD or ADHD people. What I, as an analyst and with my focus on dreams, I would want to see what was happening in their dream life. I have a hypothesis that the ADD and the ADHD might be like kind of a manic response to a great feeling of, of a deep insecurity. If something happened in that early stage with the mother-child attachment, and if there wasn't a secure attachment, then one of the ways you would feel so insecure in the world that could imagine how a hyperactivity would be a way of trying to, to flee anything that is threatening your sense of security, which is very small. So I could imagine that there could be some neuronal effects on the way the brain develops and so on, but I just haven't worked enough with them as an analyst uh, to be able to make more than an educated guess. So one thing I would be most curious about is if they could establish by means of meditation or yoga or something, a sense of a safe place. And if they could establish that, then I suspect it would be a matter of how quickly they could go from that into like manic overactivity. But that's what I would, would want to know. And what happens now is most likely you're going to get some medication to, uh, to reduce the symptoms of ADHD and ADD. But that would be what I don't know about. If it is possible to work with such a person to uh, find a safe and secure place, like a good sand tray. I think Terrence has worked with a group that dealt with ADD. So there may be some good cognitive behavioral type things uh, that could help help the person structure their lives and provide some kind of a container for uh, that kind of overactivity. And you mentioned that, um, so they, uh, both the father complex and the mother complex is uh, the fundamental basis for the form of anima and animus. And uh, then on the archetypal level or realm, and uh, they have uh, uh, the mother and the father complex um, have some characteristics that the maybe primitive complex, the lack of the father and the mother complexes are the formative elements of uh, the anima and animus that at the archetypal level have aspects lacking in the original complexes, providing stimulus for development away from them. It's a very important uh, Jungian concept. For those of you that had my Cinderella course, remember that it was Cinderella had, that had to go to the archetypal feminine level after her mother had died. Related to what Jung said that if you lack something significant in your kind of conscious waking relationships, the unconscious can compensate with archetypal material. So for Cinderella, her mother was weak and sick uh, in her relationship with her husband, this dominant male energy. That's all, that's the only modeling, if you will, and Cinderella had experience for a mother. But after she uh, uh, planted that twig on and, and her mother's grave and then watered it with her tears, that's when she began to establish a, a connection with the archetypal positive mothering energy, if you will. So that was an example of archetype, archetypal level energy compensating for the lack of a personal positive mothering energy. I'll also be approaching that issue as we go deeper into Iron Hans, how the boy had to get in touch with the 
archetypal dimensions of uh, negative masculine energy and transform it. That's what the fairy tale is about. Thank you, Coco. Thank you, Dennis. Okay, Shay Shay.